everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, seminar. Uh, my name is Sijin Han. Uh, I'm the director of Australian China Institute for Arts and the Culture, uh, kind of a newly appointed. Uh, I started about a month ago. Uh, prior to that, I have worked at SBS for 23 years. And uh, while I also teach uh, at a Western Sydney University and since 2006. So, um, we are very pleased to have this seminar because uh, for all the interest topics that is related to arts and culture and it's very, very much to our interest and to our heart is the history uh, and particularly Chinese Australian history. So that is our key area that uh, this institute um, is devoted time, effort and resources. Um, you know, uh, understanding uh, Promoting understanding between China and Australia is really the uh, most effective way is a through culture and the arts and the culture obviously history is very important. Especially given right now, you know, since 2000, especially 2016 census so that shows that a Chinese community now is the largest in Australia. So uh, it is very important for us all to know about Australian, Chinese Australian history in China, in Australia. And so we are very pleased to have uh, Dr. Michael Williams to start the first, um, we're going to do series, so the first one of the series about the Chinese Australian history. And uh, just a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Michael Williams, many of you will know about him. Um, he's a historian and specializing in Chinese Australian history and has written quite a lot and did a lot of research on that. He's also founding member of Chinese Australian Historical Society, and um, also author of quite late 2018 published book called Returning Home with Glory, which has just been translated into Chinese as a part of the joint translation project between ASIAC, this institute, and Beijing Foreign Studies University. And then the it's a series, so six books in the series, and one, one of them is Michael's one. It's about China, uh, Austri uh, China in Australian size. Please welcome uh, Dr. Mark Rivlin. Okay, th th thank you, Jin, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak and be the first in what I hope will be an interesting series uh, and certainly a well ne a needed one uh, on Chinese Australian uh, history. Uh, so, what I'll be doing today is not giving you a rundown of Chinese Australian history, but giving you a bit of an overview of perceptions, changing perceptions. So I've been studying uh, Chinese Australian history now for the last 20 or 25 years and in that time I've seen a great change in people's perception of what Chinese Australian history is. So not just more research and more knowledge but also shifts in how it's being treated and who is interested in it. And I find this all just as interesting as the history itself. So some of this, uh, some of my uh, findings, some of my thoughts about this will be in this particular seminar. So what I'll be doing is doing a comparison, a historical comparative, between the pre-1949 history, <coughs> which is to say 19th century, early 20th century, and the post-1999 history of Chinese in Australia, particularly looking not just at the history, but the perceptions of that history as much as anything else. And the aim is to examine a number of issues. So one is the role of white guilt. Uh, the other is the impact of the perceived or actual strength of contemporary China. So changes in China, how that's affected perceptions of Australian and Chinese history. Uh, of course, questions of identity, Chineseness, and what does it mean when we use the term Chinese Australian. And also, more particularly, the thing I'm particularly interested in is how the past is currently being used and abused to serve the needs and desires of the present. So history is always a movable feast. It's always about, uh, very often it's about how people want to see the present as much as it is about the past. So to begin, I'll begin not in the beginning or the end, but in the middle. The middle being 1901, uh, when Australia officially introduced its uh, white Australia policy, or more particularly the Immigration Restriction Act at the Federation. Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, uh, introduced that legislation. And in, as part of his speeches, part of his talking about the need for that, what he perceived as the need for this restrictive immigration policy, was that principle was more important than economics. Which is to say, he thought specifically that any trade damage that might be done uh, as a result of Australia being a bit more isolated, a bit more white, and not wanting to have any dealings with uh, Asia, uh, was okay because uh, the principle of being uh, a unified culture, 
or, or a single race was more important. Uh, and this is an interesting perception that I want to go into in a bit more detail. Now he did this because Australia was of course secure as part of the British Empire. Uh, and so trade with Britain was the key to the Australian economy. He wasn't really that concerned with trade with Japan or China or other nations at that time. He didn't consider that important. Uh, but Britain was more important. In the 21st century, of course, Australia is not, no longer secure within any empire and is a part of a globalising economy in which countries such as China uh, plays a very significant role. At the same time, white Australia has been abandoned in favour of a non-discriminatory immigration policy and this, of course, has led to an increase uh, in those who identify uh, as Chinese Australian. So this is part of the changing perspective. Uh, Chinese Australian history, <coughs> in this sense, I'm going to argue, has come uh, full circle uh, from the pre-49, uh, 1949 to the post-1989 Australian history. And this is because history and historians don't uh, operate in, in a vacuum. And so my argument will be that the rise of China and the rise in Australians identifying as Chinese Australian is having and will have an impact on how the history is perceived uh, and written. So to begin with, I'll just give a very basic overview of another context, an imperial context. So in the early 19th century, members of two empires, the British and the Chinese, were using the newly established Pacific mobility to move to new spaces on the Australian and American continents. But by the end of the 19th century, members of the British Empire in Australia had used their political dominance and security within that empire to restrict entry by members of the Chinese Empire. So this is a a broader overview of the history. But by the beginning of the 20th century, the British Empire has disappeared and the Chinese Empire has transformed and re-established itself as a dominant global force. And its members were once again seeking and gaining mobility around the Pacific, including to the Australian continent. So in that over overview, uh, imperial overview, we can look more specifically uh, at the history. Now when I talk about the pre-1949 and the post 1989 Chinese Australian history. Uh, this is some of the features that I'd, I'd like you to consider as the both similarities and differences. So obviously pre-1949 it was overwhelmingly Cantonese. Now even that term Cantonese needs to be unpacked, but I'll, for, just for the sake of argument I'll just use the broad terms Cantonese and Mandarin. Uh, it's uh, pre-1949 it was also overwhelmingly male, it was overwhelmingly working class, and it was perceived uh, by most Australians at the time, throughout most of that period, as being non-white. Right? So not just that Chinese were non-white, but simply perceived it in those categorical terms. Most of that period, uh, China was weak. That's to say, not a major player on the world stage. And again, the perceptions of people, of Chinese or any non-whites within Australian history, was that they were on the fringe of national history. National history would took place by other people, Chinese and others were simply not that important to, to them. In the post-89 period, things have changed. It's Mandarin, and again, I'll talk a bit more what I mean by that. I don't just simply mean the language, but just as a marker. It's family oriented. The immigration to Australia is by and large couples. It's females as well as males. It's therefore children. It's very different from the uh, pre-1949 history. It's more middle class. Not exclusively middle class, but certainly much larger. And this, again, changes perceptions, changes how people are seen and how they behave. It's multicultural, again, meaning Within the context of Australia, Chinese in Australia are seen as being one element in a diverse multicultural society rather than simply labelled as non white, although again, that's not an exclusive way that people do things, but it's a tendency uh, that you can mark out. Uh, and of course, uh, China is now a much stronger and growing stronger nation, and this again has changed perceptions, changed how we see Chinese in Australia and changed how the history is seen. Uh, and what I'll argue is we're in the midst of a re uh, inventing of the historic role of Chinese in Australia. So, so how things are perceived, how things are argued, uh, uh, is changing. So again, as I said before, this comparison aims to examine the role of white guilt, the impact of this perceived strength of contemporary China, questions of identity in the Chinese diaspora in Australia, and how the past is used to serve the needs and desires of the present. So just to go into some detail about some of these factors that I'm talking about. Again, not everybody understands just how narrowly uh, focused the immigration from China to Australia was in the pre-1949 period. So it's not just the single province uh, of Guangzhou, but just a handful of counties, eight to 15 counties around the Pearl River Delta, uh, mostly connected to Hong Kong. Um, 
And within those uh, counties, uh, Cantonese was spoken in a number of different dialects uh, and even a few languages as well that were not, cannot be described as simply the same as Cantonese. So you've got dialect and language differences within there which are important because they were important to the people at the time. That was how they organised themselves, it's how they organised their shops, how they organised their, their uh, links back to the villages, it's how they formed their, their groups and clans, both in Melbourne, <coughs> Sydney and elsewhere in Australia. So it's important to people. So the idea of using Cantonese is really just a bit of a, a label. And if Cantonese is a label that's not entirely accurate, then the label Chinese isn't necessarily as accurate. So this is just something that uh, you need to bear in mind. The idea of people being conscious of being Chinese is something that grew gradually over this period of time, going back in the 19th century through into the 20th century. In the post-89 period, uh, it's more Mandarin. By Mandarin, I mean simply from other locations around China. But most people speaking Mandarin, although they probably also speak often speak other dialects as well, which again are important to people, but maybe not as important as it was in the pre-1949 period. But nevertheless, something that's important to people is something to be considered by people who are uh, doing the history. <coughs> so this is some of the changes that are taking place. Uh, as I said before, it was male. Again, just these figures here to show, just show you how overwhelmingly male the immigration from China was in the 19th, uh, early 20th century. Very few females. <coughs> But there were, of course, females. There were wives, but they were in the villages. Uh, uh, that's where people went to take their money back to. That's what they often travelled back to. So there were wives, there were families. They were just located differently. They weren't necessarily a high migration to Australia. And there was relatively high intermarriage. We shouldn't neglect that. It's probably underestimated, but the intermarriage between Chinese men and women in Australia was higher than most people think or realise. It's kind of been a bit hidden to some extent, but people now with family history research is finding more and more the ancestry, Chinese ancestry that many people have, particularly in Queensland uh, and rural New South Wales. Uh, post 89, <coughs> we have to say, if anything, there's more females than males uh, among Chinese Australians today. Uh, but more importantly, it's couples, it's families, it's a high birth rate, and therefore that's of course a flow on effect uh, in, uh, in, in the demographics of Australia. Uh, working class, pre-1949, most people came from villages. They could be described as peasants. When they arrived in Australia, they worked as miners and market gardeners. There were, of course, merchants. Uh, you can see from the statistics there, something like 12 or 13% could be described as merchants. Some of them were merchants when they left China. Others became merchants as they, as they learned and, and evolved in Australia itself and got some capital. But by and large, most people worked uh, in what could be broadly seen as a working class. Uh, environment. If they had some capital, they were more likely to shift that capital uh, to Hong Kong or to Shanghai, uh, any large amounts of capital. Uh, in the post-89 period, uh, people are more likely to be university educated, uh, more likely to be professionals. Not, oh, again, overwhelmingly, but enough to, to shift the, the thinking and the perceptions. Uh, sometimes people, uh, even if they have capital, they've already got their capital in, in China and they're investing it in Australia. So a different flow, a different way of flowing. Uh, than, in, than in the past. So again, significant uh, impact here. From Australian perspectives, <coughs> the pre-1949 pre, uh, period can be described, uh, trans-Australian history can be described as being non-white, by which I mean that's how people were perceived. Uh, that period of history can be characterised as an increasing series of restrictions, uh, 1855, 1861, the first restrictions in Victoria and uh, New South Wales. They were ramped up again in 1881 and 1888. And up to that point, 1888, these restrictions were specifically directed only at Chinese people. So Australia didn't have immigration, or the colonies didn't have immigration restrictions except those that were imposed only on Chinese people. That in 1901 was much more uh, generalised. It was meant to exclude anybody who was non-white uh, and therefore was the establishment of what's seen as the white Australia policy. But it's probably not too much of a stretch to say that the White Australia policy was hammered out uh, on the Chinese during this period of time. <clears throat> now, of course, in the post-89 period, Australia has adopted uh, a multicultural approach, uh, and therefore we then have what you could consider hyphenated Australia, Australians, Chinese Australians, Italian Australians, uh, Filipino Australians. That is to say, uh, a diversity that recognises uh, people from different cultures, different backgrounds. Uh, and this, of course, changes how you perceive the history, not just now in the post-89 period, but <coughs> as you look back on this pre-1949 period. And many people are now trying to rewrite the history to make Australia seem more multicultural 
uh, in the past, or should we bring out these things? And again, this has an impact on how you perceive uh, the history. Another important uh, feature, I think, uh, that, that we need to look, really look at is that the strength, or otherwise, of China. So China as a nation, China as an empire. So in pre-1949 uh, period, we have basically a weak uh, China. Certainly during the period of the Qing dynasty, mostly in decline in the 19th century, uh, much difficulty with European colonial interference. Even after 1911 and the fall of the Qing, the Republic of China, again, is relatively weak, it goes through its warlord period, and of course the period of the Japanese invasion, which means it, it cannot uh, deal very much on the international stage. Uh, after 1949, the PRC is relatively isolated politically until the 1970s, so again, doesn't have much uh, of an impact except in the Cold War terms, but I won't be deal dealing with that uh, very much in this lecture. So, People's Republic of China, sorry. Uh, so again, political change in 1949 is why I picked that date as a, as, as a defining, defining term. The two, two dates, I just mentioned that then, is 49 and 89. Of course, the two dates are important in Chinese terms, what's happening in China, not in Australian terms. So this is, again, the emphasis that things happening in China are influencing Australia. Australia doesn't grow or develop historically in isolation, particularly it's China's Australian history. So these dates are things that happen in China, not happen in Australia, but they impact upon Australia. So post 89 period, <clears throat> a 400% or more increase in trade with China, as China grows and develops, becomes Australia's largest uh, trading partner you know, in this post, in this period after 89. And attitudes, political attitudes of China uh, become important uh, to, to Australia, increasingly so in the last last few years. Some of these things have moved into a more negative, negative space on occasion. And again, this impacts upon the history and how people perceive or wish to perceive the history. <clears throat> now, moving more into the, this history, uh, pre-1949 uh, period, in general, people saw uh, Chinese in Australia as being on the fringes of national history. So national history took place and Chinese involvement in that was just uh, marginal. Uh, they were mostly seen as victims only, not participants, if remembered at all and usually seen in terms of stereotypes. Gold miners and market gardeners, uh, not very much in terms of individuals, and not very much beyond these, these stereotypes. In the post-89 period, there's been a re-evaluation of this history, with many, particularly local areas, kind of rediscovering uh, their Chinese history. History that was always there, but they had neglected it, or forgotten about it, or not seen it as being important or, or central to their history. Uh, part of this has been about establishing a claim so again, you've got more people in Australia identifying as Chinese Australian, and therefore it's of their interest to see that Chinese have a longer history within Australia. So this is about establishing a claim, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. It's also about white guilt. Uh, white guilt, in this case, I'm talking about simply people acknowledging the racism and the discrimination of the past, being bad about it, and then trying to kind of exercise that guilt. It's a dangerous way, a dangerous psychology, and it doesn't really, isn't very helpful to history in many ways, but it's nevertheless something that's important and needs to be taken uh, account of. And tourism. Uh, tourism being uh, part of this rise of China. Your rise of China means you have a rise of the middle class, you have a rise of people who have money, and now they're touring around the world, they're becoming tourists. Uh, everybody wants a bit of the tourist dollar, and this is also impacted upon uh, history uh, within Australia in general, some interesting ways. What is this, what is this reinterpretation I'm talking about? So the new Australian his historiography, by, by which I mean uh, the academic his historiography, not popular history, but people actually doing professional research in history, doing it in depth, uh, has by and large managed to show <coughs> a greater impact uh, of Chinese on Australia in the 19th and early 20th century, far greater, more integrated than the popular history. So by popular history, as I mean the general mainstream histories of Australia, or perhaps the more popular ones that are uh, in the bookstores and so forth, the ones that tend to deal more in stereotypes in, in depth. Uh, they've shown, for example, the importance of shopkeepers in the rural towns, uh, whole families, Chinese Australian families that ran networks of shops in these rural towns and were very important to the economies of these towns right through the late 19th into the early 20th century. Uh, another has been the, the effort to find Chinese Anzacs. Uh, again, you know, Anzacs being, of course, a kind of uh, hardcore uh, Australian history, so the more you can find someone with Chinese ancestry who was Anzac, you're, you're embedding Chinese Australia within the hardcore of Australia. Uh, again, a bit of a dubious uh, um, historical 
uh, play, but nevertheless something important about myth myths, it's about, uh, again, establishing a claim, although this claim in many ways is being led by white historians in order to kind of broaden uh, Australian history. It's a bit of a cultural war going on there. Uh, the importance of links to China, of course, is another thing that people have discovered more and more of, and how this is ongoing on a village and also a large international capital level. Business enterprises, of course. Uh, basically, the social interaction of Chinese and Australia went well beyond racism. It wasn't just about racism. It was about intermarriage, it was about family. It was about uh, helping people. It, was about, uh, it worked on many, many levels, and, and many, many people have begun to discover more about this. And even uh, on a cultural level, Chinese opera, for example, ran in Australia from the late, <coughs> from the uh, uh, Gulfers period in Victoria right through to the beginning of the 20th century, something that by and large seems to have been completely forgotten. Uh, but you know, right here in Sydney, there was quite regular Chinese operas going down in Katsurai Street uh, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century uh, before fading out. So many of these perceptions are hampered rather than, than helped by white guilt and also by the desire for identity, that's to say, the desire of those that identify as Chinese Australians to have a claim to have a long history within Australia. <coughs> so white guilt. So this is fine, of course, as an, a re-examination of past wrongs and oppressions. So there's nothing wrong with a bit of white guilt. You've got to uh, uh, knowledge your past. You've got to look at what was done wrong, what was done right, and decide whether, in fact, you can do better. <coughs> but very often it leads to exaggerations. It leads to a focus just on the most violent aspects or the most racist parts of history uh, and the tend to exclusion of other, other aspects. Uh, it often leads to uh, exaggerations because this is a good story. I mean, violence, the newspapers, journalists, these often use these things. So I like, like a good story. A few lynchings here and there, a few murders. That makes for a better history than simply the more nuanced history that an academic might want to write. It's also partly driven by a need to keep up with the Americans. The Americans have a very violent racial history. We all know that. And so often people think, oh, Australian history perhaps is too quiet, too, a bit too peaceful in comparison. And so you know, you've got to think, oh, they were lynching people over in America. It must have happened here in Australia as well. So there's a little bit of an element of that goes on with this idea of trying to make the history as racist as, as possible. Which is not saying I'm going to deny there's got lots of racism, there had plenty of it, but it simply wasn't necessarily quite on the, on the standard of the Americans. So the danger, of course, is that this can lead to a perpetual victim states. That Chinese or other minorities are simply seen as perpetual victims all the time because of what the need for the white guilt to simply kind of exercise this, this, uh, this the, what they did. It keeps, keeps the whites at the centre of the stage and doesn't allow other people a, a voice. So these are the dangers I'm saying. He, I mean, obviously there's a danger of, 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 of denying racism on the other side. We certainly want, don't want to do that, but you don't want to overemphasize the racism to the exclusion of other relations, other ways of interacting. Uh, because it can limit the understanding. Uh, it limits nuance, uh, it limits uh, some of the contradictions. There are always contradictions. Arthur Corwell, uh, is often seen, for example, as one of the most racist immigration ministers, very anti-Chinese. He always went down to Chinatown, always had Chinese friends, spoke a bit of Cantonese himself, had quite a lot of my friends in the Chinese community. It's a contradiction. It's, people are contradictions. Arthur Corwell was contradictory. Everybody's contradictory. Um, <clears throat> so, some of this idea of white guilt, of course, is about making the past worse in order to make you feel better about the present. And I think that's, again, a dodgy, a dodgy claim. I mean, the present isn't as good as we as we think it is, and you don't make it better by simply making the past worse. In fact, you make it harder to understand the present if you deny some of the contradictions and some of the good things that happened in the past, some of the struggles that people had. Of course, it's the same struggles as we have today. Uh, <clears throat> there's also, a, uh, so we're talking here mostly about white guilt, but there's a Chinese parallel in this. As I say again, Chinese Australians will often also emphasise the racism of the past for similar kinds of reasons, the idea being that then you can say, oh, how pioneers, how ancestors went through this terrible field of fire. Now, but well, we're better. We, we're doing better. So it's against the comparison to make yourself feel better about the present. And that's fine, and it's true enough in various ways, but it also helps you to obscure things. Obscures sometimes more uh, than it eliminates. This perception, and I'm not saying one way is right, one way is wrong, but I think it's good to, to be aware uh, of a range of things. <coughs> now, the strength of China. Uh, <clears throat> so mainly, this is in the, in the recent uh, contemporary times, has been mostly perceived in terms of economic terms, a rise of trade and the rise of tourism, again, another aspect of that uh, economic, uh, economic increase. So this has increased respect 
Uh, having a lot of money, people respect people with lots of money. Chinese have lots of money, you must respect them more. The culture must be better than we thought uh, because they've got lots of money. This is a kind of very modern capitalistic way of looking at things. Very superficial, unfortunately it's, very, it's also very true. Um, so there has been an increased respect for things Chinese, and that's good, and that, that's flowed onto a range of things well beyond economics. Uh, it's led to people wanting to acknowledge past wrongs, but it means that they often want those wrongs to be firmly in the past and to ignore any wrongs that might be happening today. Uh, it kind of emphasised the idea that everyone's equal now because we've all got money, uh, uh, there's nothing that needs to be changed except, of course, a bit more economic activity going on here and a bit more money. Some of the, uh, just again, just to give an example of how this plays out in, on the historical level, uh, Tasmania has rediscovered its Chinese past at some point. So uh, Tasmania actually did have small Chinese communities in northeastern Australia at the end of the 19th century. They were tin mines, tin mines in northeast Australia, fairly isolated areas. Uh, uh, but but the uh, Chinese miners came down from Victoria, went over into Tasmania, lived there for quite a number of years. About five villages were there that were fairly almost exclusively Chinese. They had their own temples. Uh, they lasted for a couple of generations, and then they faded out as the tin faded out, and people returned to Victoria or, or back. Or back to China. And that was a bit well forgotten uh, in Tasmanian history until Chinese tourists started turning up. How do you attract Chinese tourists? Well, one way is you say, well, you emphasise that there was some Chinese history here. And so they developed this uh, trail of the Tin Dragon. Quite a lovely little tour. It goes, winds its way through, the, through some very nice uh, places, has these little memorials and markers and talks about the Chinese history. And that's a, just an example, one example of how local areas have begun to rediscover their Chinese past and linked it very clearly to tourism and the need to increase and attract Chinese tourists. Orange in New South Wales has done, some, done a similar thing, did a very interesting historical analysis uh, done by Barry McGowan, a very good one, and set up a uh, display in the regional museum about Chinese in their history. Previously they had neglected it and not really been very aware uh, of what was going on. Now Sydney of course has done a similar thing. There was an uh, exhibition uh, in Sydney, the Museum of Sydney in 2015, called the Celestial City Exhibition. It was a terrible exhibition in that, in that it was a, almost totally a white guilt type uh, exhibition. It just simply emphasised racism. Uh, it, it really centred the white people as being the most important thing in, in Chinese history. And it was kind of meant to, be, to say how terrible whites were. Uh, but by and large, it didn't give you too much of an idea of the history. <coughs> now, Barry O'Farrell, the Premier at the time, opened the exhibition. And in it, he said, he declared that this exhibition, this kind of exhibition, was important precisely because it helped to exercise ghosts of the past that would smooth the way for greater trade in the future. So he very clearly stated this kind of uh, economic imperative. That basically, you acknowledge all these crimes in the past, then you can forget about them, and then you can move on and, and have lots of trade. So again, I think a very superficial view, but uh, he's just a politician, a premier. I don't blame him personally, he just said it very clearly. I do blame the museum. Uh, and I was quite annoyed with them at the time. So, another aspect uh, is questions of identity. Of course, this is something I could go into uh, a great deal, a lot of detail, but I'll just mention it in passing, just to make idea, this idea of chinese Of course, the English has only the one word, Chinese, and that causes a lot of, a lot of difficulties. Uh, we're talking about Chinese nationals, but we're also talking about people who are, uh, I mean, national China of the state, the PRC. Uh, but we also talk about people who have a cultural, racial identity, including, of course, many people for, uh, from remigration. That is to say, people of Chinese origin, who identify as Chinese, coming from places such as Malaysia and Vietnam. Their family may well have originated in China, but it may could have been three, four, five generations ago. Uh, they may not speak any Chinese dialect uh, anymore when they, by the time they arrive in Australia, but they still will identify as Chinese Australians for various reasons. And of course, then you have the many Australian born Chinese, again, often of four or five generations. Um, uh, so, all these people can be classified as Chinese Australians or self identify as Chinese Australians, but of course, it's not always the same thing. There's quite a lot of diversity, and we have to remember that when we're talking about it. <clears throat> There's been an increased identification with Chinese heritage for a variety of reasons. One, uh, it's been family history. I mentioned before that people are more and more digging into their family histories, and some are discovering. Uh, Chinese members uh, in their ancestry, their grandfathers and great-grandfathers and generations. And nowadays, they're likely to be proud of that and want to learn about that. A couple of generations ago, that's the kind of thing that would have been, like a convict past, would have been hidden, uh, which is why they wouldn't necessarily know about it. But more and more people uh, are doing that. 
and many, much of this is to do with class changes as well. Uh, people uh, identify uh, because they want to identify. Bush, people, middle class people, bourgeois people like to be identify themselves as something. They want something different. It's a bit boring just to be white in, in middle class. So if you're white middle class but with a Chinese ancestor or a Conflict ancestor or an Aboriginal ancestor, that's more exciting. So it's, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of this is going on uh, at the time. This is influencing how people see uh, the history. Now, I've talked about people using and abusing history to serve the needs of the present. I just want to give this as one example, as an extreme example of how people want to do this. Many people want to believe that Zheng He discovered Australia, or just want to be ships modelled off course and discovered Australia. Now, I'll just be categorical and say that's it. nonsense, of course, absolute nonsense. <laughs> now, the maps of Zheng He, where we went, very clear, you know, exactly where we went. But why do people want to believe this? Well, they want to believe for the same reason they set up these statues to Captain Cook. They say British descendant people set up and declared that Captain Cook discovered Australia. It's making a claim, right? It's saying, if a white British guy discovered Australia, the British belong here. The British descendant people belong here. And that was Australia's way of doing things right up until the 60s and 70s. And yeah, of course, there's still statues still there and annoying the hell out of people uh, who are indigenous Australians who thought they discovered it. So a similar kind of thing. Chinese people, sometimes, some Chinese people, I know means all, want to do the same thing. If Zheng He discovered Australia, even if it was just a boat sailing past and waving, somehow makes a claim. It makes Chinese belong to Australia. It's fine. I can understand that psychologically, historically, it's rubbish. <coughs> Mark Cheyenne is a better deal. He, of course, uh, last year, people celebrated the 200 years of Chinese in Australia. They picked on Mark Cheyenne because he can be identified by name as one of the first Chinese to arrive in Australia. His descendants still live in Australia. He ran a pub right here in Parramatta. So he's a great, <coughs> great symbol. It's a symbolism. It's, it's myth, 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 it's a myth, it's mythologizing the history. Uh, you know, and again, it's understandable psychologically, even if it's a bit dodgy uh, historically. Another piece of myth is to do with Lambing Flat, <coughs> often mentioned again and again as a, a major racial turning point in Australia. Again, it's keeping up with the Americans, having a violent race riot. Certainly it was a violent race riot. Thousands of people were driven off the gold fields. The question is, did anyone die at Lambing Flat? And the, question, and the answer is, of course, no. Or if anyone did die, it was one white miner shot by a policeman. <coughs> but nevertheless, amongst many people, they, they will believe that many people did die. Uh, this memorial here, the one in the top, <coughs> is at Brookwood Cemetery at the moment. It was set up a few years ago by a Chinese uh, community group. Uh, originally, the, the memorial was going to say a memorial to those who died at Lemmy Flat, <coughs> until it was pointed out to them that nobody died at Lemmy Flat. So they changed it to say a memorial to those who might have died at Lemmy Flat. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't going to, you know, they compromised a little bit. <coughs> so again, the question comes why do people want to believe that a lot of people uh, died? Uh, certainly, the, 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 the newspaper reports at the time were very lurid, and, and, and these kind of illustrations were around. So, right from the beginning, there was a lot of exaggeration going on, and it's very key, key to, the, to some of Australia's history. Some people claim the white Australian policy was born here. Again, people want simplistic answers for these kinds of things. They want a specific answer, as if Australia wouldn't have had a white Australian policy if Lambing Flat hadn't come up, hadn't come about. Um, but the interesting thing here, the reason I focus on this, is that Lambing Flat <coughs> is now a festival, the Lambing Flat Chinese Festival. So Yang is the town near Lambing Flat. This is a memorial garden that's been built uh, close to where some of the mines were at Lambing Flat itself. Uh, and Lambing Flat, in order to attract tourists, because Chinese tourists, has developed its own festival. So it's managed to, to, to um, square the circle by actually having a f uh, kind of a, a happy tourist festival that attracts Chinese tourists Based really, it's only claimed to flame, it's only claimed links with China is having a race riot that drove Chinese miners off the gold fields. Uh, and they've managed to do this fairly successfully. It's a fairly popular uh, festival. And I won't go into the details how they do it. There's a little few controversies going on there, but by and large, they've managed to do it because people, uh, well, I say, we'll use history for a variety of purposes, and, and really it doesn't matter what the reality may or may not be. So, Coming to the conclusion, I'm just going to go over <coughs> four very recent um, uses of uh, uh, Chinese Australian history. Two by professional historians, uh, John Fitzgerald and Sophie Couchman, and two by non-professionals who have used history uh, for their own purposes. Monica Tang <coughs> in her book Stranger Country and Tim Watts uh, in his The Golden Country, uh, recently published. <coughs> 
Now, Tim Watts, to start with Tim Watts, he's a, a Labor politician who wrote a book. He's a descendant of white settlers. Uh, and he's in this, he uses the history to kind of give a background uh, to what he sees as the future of Australia in terms of multicultural business. So what he's done, he's done a fairly standard look at Australia's racist past. Uh, tinged with the white guilt argument that I've been talking about, but with a more positive spin because he's very keen, as a, as a politician, he's very keen to kind of be a leader for the future. And his claim to uh, links to China is that he's married to a Hong Kong born woman and his children therefore are mixed uh, uh, Asian Australians. Uh, he's worried about their future. No, no, that's fair enough. He's done what a lot of popularizers do. He's read somehow when people do their historical research, they seem to be incapable of looking at anything that's less than 20 years old. So he, his history's okay. There's nothing particularly wrong with it. But it just there's nothing there that looks at anything that was written in the last 20 years. He did speak to Stephen Fitzgerald. He did speak to Aaron uh, uh, Chen, but a uh, few you know few people directly. But by and large, it's old history. But not necessarily wrong for that. But it's a bit outdated. <clears throat> but, it's a, but it served his purposes, which was to kind of, again, talk about the racist past of Australia, <laughs> so that he can then talk in terms of the what he hopes will be a multicultural future for Australia. So he's using it for his own purposes. And when I go over these histories, I'm not saying any of them are wrong. I'm just saying that different perceptions, perspectives, different perceptions of the history. Monica Tan, <coughs> she's a uh, identifies as a Chinese Australian herself. <clears throat> did a very interesting book. She did a tour around Australia and then wrote up her notes about it. And it was all about identity and uh, as a Chinese Australian, identity as an Australian. Identity is somebody non-Indigenous in meeting various Indigenous communities and Indigenous peoples. Now she uses the history in another way. She's looking at um, the Chinese role in colonial Australia, the Chinese role in uh, uh, usurping Aboriginal culture and land. Uh, and so she takes a, a twist that says, Rather than the other way that would say, oh, well, Chinese and Aborigines, they were all minorities. They, should, they, they, were, they were nice and friendly together against the evil whites. That's a kind of stereotypical view. She realises that, of course, the Chinese were really uh, in, as much part of the colonial regime as any other white person, and that they used uh, uh, their space within, within Australia to expropriate Aboriginal land as well and to get what they wanted out of it. So they also have a role within this. And she identifies that. And she, I think she can do that because she's quite comfortable in her Australianness and her Chinese Australianness. So she's not got an axe to grind in that. She just realises as an Australian, we have to acknowledge this. And just as a white Australian has to do it, so does a Chinese Australian has to do the same kind of thing. Has to kind of acknowledge their role within uh, Australia, Australian history, and the role vis vis the Aboriginal Indigenous Australia. Now, the <coughs> two professional historians have taken two different lines. Now, John Fitzgerald at the moment <coughs> is very concerned about China and China's role in Australia. And so what he's written here in China's Century of Humiliation and Australian Chinese History is he's highlighting the danger of uh, Chinese uh, uh, influence on Australian history, as I say, using it for their own purposes. And so when he's talking about the Century of Humiliation, he's talking about the Communist Party's standard line which says <coughs> that only the Communist Party can protect China from the Century of Humiliation, a century where the colonial powers and uh, weak China was a victim, and that included the overseas Chinese. They weren't able to be protected because China was weak. If China is strong, then it can protect the overseas Chinese. <coughs> now, there is some hints that some people can use that line to rewrite Australian history. Now, I would argue that, uh, while that's true enough, I and mean, the Communist Party might well write history any way it likes, there is an organic reason why anyone who's a Chinese Australian might want to also mm -hmm. emphasise the racism, emphasise the past for their own purposes. That has nothing to do with Beijing, nothing to do with the Communist Party. So, so John Fitzgerald is just emphasising one aspect of this. But nevertheless, it's, it's an aspect that does exist. So another perception, another way of looking at it. Uh, so the Couchman is taking a more <coughs> um, a orthodox line. She's looking at Barry McGowan. And Barry McGowan uh, was a very good historian who particularly looked at how Chinese Australians integrated in the community. It wasn't all about racism. He was looking at miners, he was looking at country areas, he was looking at places like Braidwood, uh, and he was saying it wasn't just, again, similar kind of thing. It wasn't just all about lambing flat and racism. It's all about, there was a much wider interaction that people had. It included racism, but included interaction into marriage and getting on in the economy and community and socialising. And Sophie is emphasising this as well, and talking about reconsidering race. And in that particular paper, she looks at lambing flat in detail as well. Again, from an orthodox historian's point of view, going over the details, going over 
So you can see from these four um, books how diverse perceptions of Chinese Australian history can be and are being. These are just four random examples I picked up from very recent, uh, recent publications. There's a lot more going on and there's a lot more that will go on uh, in the future. So to conclude, <coughs> I just want to say that um, <coughs> obviously it's obvious that change in the present uh, means change in the past. And there's nothing special about this in terms of Chinese Australian history. All history does this. Americans do this. Donald Trump tries to do this. Uh, um, and Scott Morrison tries to do this. Howard certainly tried to do that. Prime Minister Howard in the past tried to do this, to rewrite history for their own purposes. In the present. This is just standard use of history and annoys hell over historians, but uh, it's just part of the professional um, uh, milieu that you work in. So history is always being uh, re-examined to meet the needs of the present day. Australians, including, of course, present day Chinese Australians. So it's not about uh, definitive or objective history, but more about myths, myth creation and myths busting. So the question we need to ask, though, is that do we just want to exercise the ghosts of the past and move on, or do we want to learn uh, from the past? So in the story, that's the question that I'd like to ask. And I thank you very much for your time. One of the slides suggested that there were more um, market gardeners than mm. miners in Australia. Did you be the occupation before they came to Australia or in Australia? That, no, 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 in Australia. In Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite staggering, isn't it, that they probably saved so many mining communities by growing vegetables, actually. Yeah, and, yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. Stopping scurvy and all sorts of diseases. But, but that is actually the occupations in Australia. Yeah. So yeah. more people were market guarding than were mining. Oh, well, at that time, that, that was towards the end of the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was about 1900. That was later, yeah. That, that was, was 1900. Yeah. Towards the end of 1900. And then diversified. Well, yeah. the first wave came as miners, but they weren't the same people. They didn't hang around and become market gardeners. They went back and came back, and people came back and forth. Yeah. Market gardening suited... The thing about market gardening is it suited people because... They, were, they wanted an occupation that they could leave and go back. Uh, so you didn't have to buy the land. By and large, you didn't buy the market garden land. You released it. You could do it in a communal group, maybe five or ten people who had shares. So it really suited the, the, the lifestyle that said you want to go back to China every now and again. You would send money back. You could, go, you could sell your shares, go back, and then decide to come back uh, after a few years if you wanted to get another share in another garden and continue on. So it really suited uh, uh, people, but particularly, of course, also being from the Pearl or Delta a very intensive market, uh, gardening area, not just vegetables, but a whole lot of gardening. So they, could, they, they knew how to garden, and they knew how to do it in, intensively with water cultivation. So they were suited, similarly in California. Uh, if you go to Sacramento, if you ever travel from San Francisco to Sacramento, the Delta region, all that area is, is drained swamp, and it was all done by Chinese workers who were doing the same thing in the Pearl River, because the Pearl River Delta was all drained uh, river flats that have kind of pulled it out. From the, from the river. So again, they knew how to do that kind of stuff and they did the same thing in, uh, in, in well, California. That's fascinating. Yes. That's fascinating. Um, I wondered while you were talking about pre-1949 and post-1989, I mean, what happened in that 40 years? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things happened, of course, but just for my purposes, I wanted to show uh, intense interaction between China and Australia. So in that period, the interaction with China and Australia was much less. There were, of course, Chinese people in Australia, particularly as Chinese Australians, and there were people coming from Malaysia and Singapore and Hong Kong to Australia. Of course, the white Australia policy dominated most of that period, so it was relatively low numbers. So it's a very interesting period, but it's distinctly different from the pre-49 and the post-89. And when I just did, wanted to show them as markers. When did they get rid of the white Australia policy? Uh, well, that's a, uh, uh, <laughs> we argued, <laughs> it's a, a grey area. I mean, certainly the Conservative government gradually dismantled it piece by piece in the 60s and 70s, and then the Whitlam government normally eliminated it, uh, though by contrast they eliminated it officially and then reduced the immigration flow so that very few people could actually come at that period. Then Fraser actually, uh, actually Fraser deserved a lot more credit. He actually opened up Australia, so he used yeah. the, the change that had happened under the Whitlam government, but then people actually began to come um, in, in, the, in the Fraser government period. And then, then we were shifting into a full multicultural after that, and in theory, a, a, a non-discriminatory immigration policy. Uh, so there's no specific year they got rid of So we, we, we want to move around? No, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Other questions? Or, yeah, sorry.
I actually read the uh, the Sophie Couchman article mm. uh, your, uh, <laughs> in response to your uh, post on Facebook during the week, uh, and I certainly accept. I'm, I'm a bit concerned that, uh, uh, and I accept that there are no recorded deaths of that in fact, for example. But I'm a bit concerned that there might be a tendency to go a bit Keith Winshuttle on this and, and say just because no white bureaucrat has recorded in triplicate the death of an Aboriginal person in Tasmania there were no massacres. So Yeah, but I, I, I the reason really the reason I'm far. I'm fairly confident there isn't isn't because for two reasons. First off, though, these were golf fields and there were golf earth acts and golfers were very heavily regulated. Mm. There were coroners investigations every time someone died. Mm. That's that's one thing. And the other thing is that there was an extensive uh, investigation of land flat, but the Chinese miners put in a large petition arguing for their money back and their tents back and all their stuff that was destroyed. They listed everything in great detail. None of them said anyone died. None of them said, now, I'm not saying that, they, that maybe there's some political reason they didn't want to do that. They thought they wouldn't get their tent back if they said that someone had died. But no, there was a lot of information in the, in the commissions and in, in the inquiries. Not, none of them mentioned anything like that. The only thing that kind of talks about deaths are the newspaper journalists who often weren't even there. They were just writing it back in Sydney and just trying to stir things up. So when you look at it in detail, and there are some very good detailed examinations. Sophie's one, but there's another one that was done quite a few years ago that went into all that. Or if you look at the, you know, I mean, if you've if you if you've got together your petition and you're writing down every detail of every pot that you lost and every tent that got burnt and everything that you want back and you're demanding from the government money, and somebody's died as well, well, wouldn't that strengthen your case to say, oh, we lost 10 people? Uh, no mention at all. So again, it's not co absolutely conclusive, but in terms of historical uh, analysis, I think you can be fairly confident to say there wasn't uh, a death, because I think they would have mentioned it. There's no reason not to mention it. It would have strengthened their case. Um, that's that's yeah. what I base things on. I don't know whether Sophie mentioned a petition, but it was. No, that's, that's, no. I'm not sure about that. We need another one. Yeah, that, that, that's certainly true. Yeah. Sorry, Michael, I just wanted to point out two things. If we're talking about Chinese as in hand migration, you're right about predominantly from the capital. But actually people forget about the large number of China-born Shanghainese Russian, they count themselves as Chinese, they speak Mandarin, who migrated here prior to 1949. Hundreds and hundreds of them settled around um, kept, what became Capital Mato, but mm -hmm. around that area. Mm -hmm. They were actually Chinese. They didn't count themselves, uh, just that they're Russian ethnic. Yeah, they're Russian exactly. They're still, so perfect to they're still today, those who survive, are still alive, yeah. still tell me in Mandarin that they are Chinese. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to include that. As no, no, well, we, we're talking about migration from China. Say, there's, there's the, the diversity, as I've heard, China, yes. there's a lot yeah. of diversity, and of course the white Russians yes. are. Yeah. Oh, one of those very interesting uh, uh, history. And one last thing, yeah. technically, Captain Cook did not discover. Well, Captain Cook mm. might have discovered Australia, what became Australia, but the Dutch are the one that found the continent and call it the Australis. So I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. By, I mean, historically, you have by, to be yeah, that's the British trying to yes. make a claim in the same way yeah. as John yeah. Hurt yeah. uh, did. So, so yes, Dutch, uh, New Holland, of course. Yeah. yeah. Any other? Any other questions? Uh, I have a question because you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, I'm not a historian, so I'm quite interested in the historian's point of view, especially mentioned changing the present means of changing the past. And that's why history is always interesting because people keep reinterpreting according to the present. How far people can go for reinterpreting the past, you know, from historians' point? Oh, well, from a science point of view, there's no limit. People mm -hmm. want to do anything. They'll do a crazy, crazy thing. If someone wants to write a movie or someone wants to write a popular book, they'll, they'll say anything. There's a lot of nonsense is written. I mean, I said the John Hurt one is the one that gets up my nose the most. You can go to the John Hurt, the, uh, uh, Nanjing, and unfortunately, you go to the museum, John Hurt's old house, and they got Menzies book there, you know, the uh, uh, 1942. The, uh, it's quite horrible. Um, so, yes, unfortunately, uh, outside of, you know, his historical perspective, but even within history, you, you can do a lot. I mean, say, people will argue uh, landing flat. I mean, I mean, historians will argue it. They're not, it's not cut and dried as I tried to make out to Bratton, and I think it's cut and dried. But there are other people who will, will argue the point. So, of course, you can always argue things. But I think there are limits 
Uh, you can say, you know, nobody died in the plane. You can say Zhang He didn't discover Australia. You can say Kevin Cook didn't discover Australia. You can say these things, but then you'll still get an argument on Facebook. You'll still get people twittering away, <laughs> telling you they, they know for sure that the <laughs> Confucius actually sent a ship down to, to make astronomical observations off the, west off the coast of West Australia. That was the most ludicrous one that I've ever, yeah. ever come across. Um, you know, so people say anything. Uh, so unfortunately, historians are just people are holding back a bit of a dike sometimes uh, in terms of popular history, uh, particularly if you want to present it on, on, a, on a film, a dra drama. By definition, a, a film is, is always going to get it wrong because they have to have a plot, they have yeah. to have a, some kind of structure, and history doesn't have a plot or structure. It's, it's as crazy as our everyday lives are. Uh, you just have to uh, imagine it is. Yep. Is there a <coughs> consolidated history of myths about yeah. what we're talking about? Yeah. A consolidated history of that? There's a very interesting article that consolidates all the imagined discoveries of China, uh, discoveries of Australia by China. There is a, by a Frank Sorry, Crowley. Sorry, what did you say? That, uh, uh, an article about, just, to, just specifically about the myths of, of Chinese discovery of Australia. There's an interesting article by Frank Crowley about that. Right. Uh, but in terms of other myths, uh, well, actually, I, did, I, I, I wrote a whole list of myths. There's an interesting range of myths to do with Chinese in Australia, like myths of the, the round uh, as opposed to square mining. Uh, um, holes, you know, there's a myth about you know, uh, uh, gold on uh, uh, buried in coffins. There's a whole lot of myths that were around in the 19th century. Some people still believe them. Um, they're usually based on ignorance of Chinese culture, ignorance of... Uh, they're, they're white myths. They're white myths about Chinese, yeah. Uh, you're talking about what kind of myths? Uh, Every kind of bloody myth. Oh, well, there's, lots of, there's <laughs> lots of myths, yeah. There's lots of, lots of myths. It would be a, and, yeah. yeah. Because I mean, there's bits and pieces around, but yeah, probably no one's nothing, tried to nothing consolidate. Nothing to no, no, that'd be a big... Seems to me that would be a, a big task, but a right thing. Yeah, it'd be interesting to... Uh, to Just one quick question, sorry. sorry. Wasn't there recently someone claimed that Australia was discovered by Chinese scientists in 1971? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that part of the world did touch on what became Australian land. Not Chinese, so okay. there, there's a, there was a trading link, it's well established a trading link going at least back to the 18th century between uh, 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 looking for, looking for uh, sea slate, Japan, to take back to China. So there's a Chinese link there, it's a trading link. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, there is one, one little Dutch uh, record that says that some Chinese guy turned up, the Dutch were colonising Indonesia at the time, yeah. said, oh, there's some, black, some Chinese guy that says he went down and saw a land with lots of black people. So there's one little hint that maybe a Chinese trader did trace his source, you know, where his trip hang was coming from for his restaurant, and, and went all the way down and actually visited his trade. So that's about the closest you'll get, and that's sometime in the uh, uh, 18th century. So, uh, so th th there's a hint. Yeah, speaking of um, myths, I don't know if this is a myth or not, but when I was up in Port Macquarie, I was visiting one of the museums up there, and they had mentioned that sometime back in the 1300s that... Um, Egyptians had come to <laughs> Macquarie. <laughs> there's no, and no they limit to the myths. Uh, it's for a few years, yeah. and there's apparently records to back it up or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not records, well, but evidence. The best book for that know. kind of rubbish is the Menzies, Gavin Menzies' book about 1492 and the year China discovered the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it, people can write all kinds of nonsense. And I did read in the paper many, many years ago that the Phoenicians were supposed to have come and visited here, and they're supposed to be riding on the caves or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hence the saying, there are pharaohs at the bottom of my car. <laughs> 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 but uh, would, my last question, you know, like, especially with the social media now, there's so much on, and, and anyone, everyone can be a historian, you know, put on their views about history. Would that make historians' job harder or more interesting? Well, it gives historians something to do, I suppose, if you want to try and rail against every single <laughs> thing that appears on social media. But, yeah. but it, does, it does give, well, I suppose, it, it's, well, let's say it gives you another perspective. So some of the perspective I've tried to be here is to ask, why do people want to believe this? So it's not yeah. just to say, oh, John Hood obviously didn't discover Australia. Mm -hmm. Why? And I think that's interesting. So it does open up questions. You know, people want to have a claim. Yeah. It's so similar to the Captain Cook claim. It's, you know, it's, and that's natural, and, and I can respect that. I mean, I'm not going to condemn that as being uh, wrong. It's, it's good to have a claim. Mark Shalini did have run a pub here in Paramount. It's good. There were Chinese people here in the earliest part of Australia. The very first fleet uh, ships went 
uh, to Canton to trade uh, after they jumped off their complex here in Sydney Harbour. So there's always this link, and it's important to, to acknowledge those kinds of things. So sometimes even the idiot stuff will bring out other questions. So it's, you can look at it that way to, uh, to help extend your no. Uh, I have a Melbourne. So in Melbourne, there's a, there's a um, museum, museum of Chinese immigrants. Yes. So, I mean, uh, the railway between Sydney and Melbourne is all built by those Chinese. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a complete myth. Did they say that in the museum? No, no, no. no. See, that's keeping up, keeping up with the Americans. Australia was more unionised. The first thing the unions did in Australia was to say only white people can build the... Only union people can build the railways. The railways in Australia were all publicly funded. In America, they were privately funded. So the private guys wanted the cheapest labour as possible. So they went straight to the Chinese merchants and said, bring me the cheapest labour you can get. And they imported all these Chinese. Australia would never happen in Australia. Oh, there was some Chinese workers on the railways in Northern Territory. Uh, some 2,000. Well, no, there were not 2,000, but there were, there were some. There were, there were, <laughs> not, not from China. Hang on. Not from China, a lot came from Singapore and Malaysia. Well, but via, Chinese. Uh, no, well, yeah, they were Chinese. And brought by the British, um, because that time was under British rule in the 1900s. So those were, those records were there. You have to go to. There are some, it's not yeah. 2000, and not from. They were via <laughs> Singapore, yes, but uh, but they were Chinese. And, yeah, yeah, there, there, there's elements there, but not New South Wales and Victoria. No, no one. No I mean, we've got pictures of who was to build the railways, and exactly who were the grassy Irish <laughs> and unionists, and, and they wanted a good pay, and they, 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 they demanded that, and it was government money, so the government had to, to go well, with the democratic vote at that time, which was to do it that way. But I'm surprised if you read that in the museum. Yeah, in, uh, in yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. I think it's really interesting that you, the way you, you see people's views like a wide, and they claim rather than just a country. Yeah. Again, in this case, it would be keeping up with the Americans, confusing with the yeah. Americans because the, yeah, the, the, really the big concentration on the American railways there. Why on earth would you come up with that round hole and square hole? There seems no advantage to it. The mining sharks. Oh, the, the, the myth was that there was about spirits, spirits that that, yeah. that ghosts with demons would hide in the corners, and oh, and that so therefore what? Chinese had, had circular yeah. uh, mining shafts. But there, in fact, there was no difference between Chinese and, and, and non-Chinese no mining shafts at all. That's a complete myth for a start. So and I don't know of any myth of. Did the myth originate from the Chinese or the whites? Oh, the whites. The whites would make things up, but it was mostly made <laughs> in the generation <laughs> after. So you, what you've got is some grandfather saying, "Oh, I used a gold miner and I had Chinese in the in." Uh, uh, you know, in the mining camp next to me, and then the grandson hears these stories from the grandfather, and then completely mucks it up because he's only a five-year-old child at the time, and then repeats these stories or writes them in a, in a newspaper. I mean, some of the newspapers in the 20s and 30s have the most atrocious rubbish. <laughs> but again, people will say, "Oh, well, it's an old newspaper; it must be true." But it, but it's written in the 1920s about the 19, 1860s. Well, of course, it's it's no closer to the truth than anything else. But people will repeat this stuff because it's printed, because it's old. Of course, it's, you know, I want to believe it. Uh, yeah, so you have to kind of keep scraping away, scraping away. Uh, One last question about Chris. Is it, is it from ah. Cantonese or not? No. no. It's, it's, <laughs> probably, it's probably Cornish. Uh, I know it's. I've heard people have said. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a lovely myth. Another one that people want to have a claim. It, yeah. it, seemed, it seemed a little bit it's reminiscent of the Cantonese, the gum, gum sign, and so forth. But, but no, it's been traced down and it seems certain that Cornish miners used it in Cornwall uh, and then brought it to Australia. Uh, but that's, again, one of the, I mean, it's a nice story and, uh, and I've used it myself, but, uh, but no, it's not. I don't think it's, it is actually a Chinese story, but, but uh, Dim Sims, definitely Chinese. Check it out. Check it out. Yes, definitely Chinese. Cantonese. Well, uh, yeah, I think, you know, otherwise we'll be able to. So you can see that how history is fascinating. It's really interesting. And uh, also, you know, Michael mentioned um, Tim Watt's book, actually. I'm trying to invite um, Tim to have a talk with us as well. So it's really good to see different people, the different views, and Michael has given these four books, it's really interesting, you know, different uh, and perspective. Uh, also, you can see uh, Michael is so knowledgeable about everything. Uh, so please give him a round of applause. Mm -hmm.